Okay. We are recording. Okay. I always find that everybody gets very quiet after the recording starts. Yes. I mean, we do have a couple of participants. Hello, everyone. So we will get started in just a few minutes. We'll, we'll wait until six o'clock on the dot. Let everyone have a chance to sign in. And Tabitha, are you okay with monitoring the chat again? So that awesome. we can- Oh, of course, absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah. Absolutely. It's hard to believe that we're already at December 1st. I know. It's both exciting and terribly frightening that time goes by so quickly. Absolutely. But exciting because I'm almost to the end of the semester. Yes. That is exciting. And to the holidays. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to everyone who has signed in already. Um, we are happy to have Dr. Ellen Flannery Schroeder from URI back with us this evening to talk about overcoming parental burnout and creating positive parent-child relationships. So we do encourage that you use the chat feature. If you have questions, ask away, and we will stop and try to address those um, as we go. And Ellen? Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I also want to say, too, that um, in light of the topic, um, I really want parents to share um, their great strategies um, with each other. I often find, you know, I, I try to teach people when I'm talking with them, but honestly, the real learning comes when we're all teaching each other. I mean, that's really the best of all circumstances. So I really welcome everyone to not only ask questions, but share any tips or strategies that have worked with you in either managing your own self-care or building positive parent-child relationships. Um, so thanks for being here with me tonight. Um, it, it's always sort of um, a difficult time of the day to join a meeting. So I'm, I'm grateful that you're here. Um, so I'll get started. Let's talk about parental burnout now that we're trying to probably multitask. Some of you may have eaten or are trying to prepare food and watch a webinar at the same time. Um, I will also just point out that there are, will be after this one, two more talks in this series. Um, so next up, January 12th, we'll be building your child's coping skills. That's a really um, important topic area. So I hope you'll join me. And March 2nd, avoiding the trap of overparenting um, in unprecedented times. All right, so, but what are we gonna talk about today? Today has two parts. Um, I always try to jam pack a lot of things in my talk. Um, hopefully I didn't jam pack too much in this, um, but I'm trying to do two things here. One, really talk about parental burnout and how to um, resist it, or mm, more likely how to uh, remedy it um, uh, because it's probably already there. Um, so we're going to talk about self-care strategies, and then um, for the second half, we'll talk about how to nurture strong and healthy parent-child relationships. Now, both of those are huge topics, so I'm only going to dip my toe into both of them, um, but hopefully give you some, some tips and strategies that can be useful, and again, hopefully you can share them with each other. So we'll start with self-care for parents and caregivers. Um, but we're going to start with a question that I'm going to pose to you. Feel free to answer this in the chat. 
Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear some of the answers. I will admit that right now I can't see the chat, but probably Tabitha will tell me what's written there. So I'm going to ask you three questions and I want you to be brutally honest. Um, what, and, and so the question is going to go like this. What brings you greater happiness? You're going to be asked to compare two things. And I want you to tell me which one in all honesty brings you greater happiness. All right, here we go. What brings you greater happiness? your child or children or watching TV. So what brings you greater happiness, your child or watching TV? I don't know if anybody's brave enough to write anything in the chat. Is there any chat, chat action going on there? Not just yet. We're gonna give some processing time. <laughs> right. It's hard to start with a hard question right at the top. Um, but I'm going to go on to the next one. It's okay if they don't answer it. It, it, it maybe it's just food for thought. Um, maybe you just answer it in your own head. Oh, hold All on, right. we have an answer. We have an answer. All it right. depends. It depends on the child, the children's moment versus the TV show. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. There are some very gripping TV shows and some really <laughs> rowdy children that we need to escape from from time to time. All and right. The so. Second response is uh, the child. Child brings her greater happiness. Child. Okay. All right. So let's ask the question again. Um, which brings you greater happiness, your child or shopping? You can think about that. I'm not going to pause too long here. We've got a third question for you. Which brings you greater happiness, your child, spending time with your child or cooking, preparing food? So we definitely have children for both of those. Both <laughs> children of those. on that one. Yeah. All right. Well, shopping as well. All right. Well, I am now going to tell you the results of a research study conducted by psychologist Daniel Kahneman, who, and if all truth be known, it was a sample of 900 employed women, mothers, employed mothers. And those 900 employed mothers um, reported being, being with their child as less enjoyable um, than many other activities, including watching TV, shopping, and preparing food. And I hear you, it really does depend. The point I'm trying to make here is that kids don't produce um, a solid flow of happiness. I think any parent would know that. Um, there are certainly moments of just incredible joy, um, but there are also some really unhappy moments um, in being a parent. So it's not all fun and games. The research suggests parenting really depresses your happiness. So this, um, I apologize to those of you who have you know, bad eyes like, like I do, but if I put my glasses on, it reflects my light that I'm trying to use to light my face. So, um, the, I'll explain this graph to you, um, or chart. So this is a graph of where parents are happier than non-parents. And so if you look, it's a list of countries, the countries on the top is where if you have children, you are happier than those individuals who do not have children. So you can see Portugal, Hungary, you know, there's a, a you know, a chunk of people with kids happier than non-kids. Now look down at the bottom, there's the United States where it is the case in the United States that if you have children, you are 12% less happy than those without children. That may or may not be surprising to you, but it's a pretty consistent research finding. And it's not just your happiness where we see some um, sacrifices that come with having kids. It's also in your marital satisfaction. So if you look at this graph, moving from left to right across the bottom, you can see that we start off married with no kids and we've got marital satisfaction that's rather high. Um, and then we move on to sort of preschool children with the oldest being five um, or kids aged younger than that. And you can see we our marital satisfaction has taken a, a pretty significant dive. Um, it takes another huge dive when you are the parents of teenagers. Um, and then as your kids begin to leave the nest, lo and behold, your marital satisfaction increases once again. I am happy to declare that I'm on the upswing um, and I feel for you who are down um, in the pits with those teenagers. So we can see that 
happiness is at least in the United States negatively affected. And if you're wondering why the United States, what's the difference between the United States and say Portugal, who's at the top of the list, um, research really does suggest that it has to do with um, child care policy. So parental leave, paid parental leave. Um, and we just don't in the United States have very good child care policy. Um, that really seems to be driving the happiness in that case. Um, so our happiness takes a hit, our marital satisfaction takes a hit. Um, and I, I love this quote, Harvard professor Dan Gilbert said, the only symptom of emptiness syndrome is nonstop smiling, which is counter to what many of us sort of expect um, or anticipate. I, I have two just out of the, the nest and I was really preparing for the worst, um, but that's another talk. So we'll move on. So if we have these hits to happiness and marital satisfaction, why on earth do we have kids? Um, because it is, you know, as the, as the Peace Corps says, it's the toughest job you'll ever love. Um, and it certainly is. I think all parents could certainly attest to that. Um, but childhood, or sorry, parenting brings other wonders with it, um, like satisfaction and purpose and meaning and exhaustion. Here's where the parenting burnout comes in. So here's, uh, you know, just a visual representation of some parenting burnout. Um, my apologies to the, um, to the fathers here, because this is just a mother. This is not to say that mothers are the only ones who experience parental um, burnout. All care, all caregivers do. Um, and I just want to note that, yes, you know, we've, we've got these weighty things on us so much to do um, and so little time to do it in. And in particular, right now, we've really sort of been hit by another significant um, stressor to add to this mix that's hovering over this poor, exhausted woman, and that is the coronavirus. So I want to just talk for a moment about what puts parents at risk for parental burnout. You know, I, I even contemplated there's some sort of assessment measures, some questions you could ask to assess for parental burnout. And I considered putting some of those questions in this talk, but I thought, you know, you know what if you're burned out, like you don't need a questionnaire to tell you that you're experiencing parental burnout. So I thought it might be more useful to really talk about what puts one at risk for parental burnout, because that you could do something about. You might know that you're burned out, but that doesn't help you to do something about it. But knowing what the risk factors are just might. Um, so what are those risk factors being overcommitted? Yep, I'm guilty of that one. Um, feelings of insecurity or incompetence as a parent, guilty again. Um, isolation, you know, in, in this case, it may be forced isolation given the pandemic. Um, so we're all kind of suffering with that one. Um, and perfectionism, um, as a recovering perfectionist myself, I am um, guilty of that as well. Um, and so I encourage you to just stop for a moment and think about how many of these you experience on a daily basis. And just take a moment to think about whether you would say you're burned out and, on, and you don't have to answer these questions out loud or in the chat, but just think about how burned out are you feeling zero to 10 with 10 being completely and utterly exhausted. And so what's the cure um, for parental burnout? I like this comic um, because it sort of illustrates that you need intensive self-care. Um, so what are you doing for the holidays? Nothing, just reconstituting my sense of self and identity. Um, so it's time for some intensive self-care. That tends to be very difficult for parents. Um, I haven't met a parent, honestly, who doesn't want the best for their kids. And parents in general are incredibly giving of themselves to a fault. Um, I'm sure um, all of you parents have read the book, The Giving Tree. Um, it's interesting, when I was a child, my mother told me it was her favorite book. And as a child, I did not understand it. And it wasn't until I had my own kids and I read The Giving Tree that I really got it. it like makes me emotional just even thinking about it. Because as parents, that's what we do. We give and give and give until we're nothing but you know a stump for our child to sit on. 
Um, so I, I really want to impress upon parents that taking care of yourself is part of taking care of your child. We can't just be the giving tree um, with no care for ourselves. So it is our responsibility to neutralize our own stress. I like those terms um, because uh, every one of us at one time or another has been guilty of, you know, going off like, like a bomb. Um, and we're all responsible for diffusing those um, parenting burnout bombs that happen now and again. Um, and so hopefully we're going to talk about some ways to do that. And, you know, it's super important to do that, um, to avoid those parenting bombs because they, they make you feel terrible. Um, they don't model great coping for your child. And we know that there's not a parent um, alive who wants their child to become a miserable, burned out, hot mess of an adult. Um, and they're watching. So how, how we cope um, and how we care for ourselves uh, will be how they learn to care for themselves. Um, and we care so deeply about our kids, um, but often sacrificing our own self and needs. So I know, I know you're going to say who has time for self-care. Um, I read a book recently where the author of the book said, um, you know, he's always suggesting to his clients that they take time for self-care and they say, oh, I don't have time for that. And he says to them, quite frankly, how much time did you spend on Instagram yesterday or Facebook? Um, and, you know, could you use some of that time for self-care? And as you'll see, that's going to be something that I recommend as well. Um, point taken, right? I mean, there isn't, um, there is rarely a day where um, I don't have some um, idle time that could have been spent somewhere else. All right. So <clears throat> self-care, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Always what you'll hear as recommendations for self-care is exercise, eat well, sleep more. Um, and I am not here to say those aren't great ideas, um, but I'm not going to cover them because of course you already know this. So those are not the self-care strategies that I'm going to talk about, not because I don't believe in them, but because you already know them. Um, and maybe you're already doing them or maybe you're not. Um, but what I'm hoping is to cover some strategies that might both help you to prevent parental burnout, but also might really lay the foundation for you to be able to reach these goals. So I'm going to talk about four self-care skills. I don't know that they're skills exactly, four self-care behaviors, let's call them, that I think really... Um, to have the potential to help you to facilitate the larger self-care goals, which you may or may not be doing. If you are, great. If you're not, um, you know, doing, doing some of these foundational skills might actually be able to help you get there. All right. I want to also point out that these four skills really kind of map onto the risk factors of um, parenting burnout. So that's that's no accident. That's how I decided on which sort of four self-care um, practices I would talk about today um, because I really wanted to neutralize um, the risk factors. So um, we'll talk about scaling back to to do what's doable as a counter to overcommitting. We'll talk about connecting to oneself and becoming more self-aware as a counter to feelings of insecurity and um, talk about connecting to others as a way to counter isolation. And last, a focus on warmth and self-compassion to really um, act against uh, perfectionism. So we'll start with scale back to doable. So in life, um, in order to sort of reduce stressors, you've got to make your life manageable and doable. And we know that we're overcommitted and we're overscheduled. So we need to scale back a little bit. We need to create a doable schedule that includes two important things. One, time out for yourself. And two, some bonding time with your kids. Time to spend with your child, um, building on the uh, relationship that you have with them. 
Also, um, it's super important to support your own well being. So, I want to encourage you to ask, what am I doing for my child that I'm not doing for myself? Because I have no doubt that you are ensuring that your child is eating well, that your child is getting sufficient sleep. And even if they're not, you're certainly doing your best to make sure that that happens. Um, you are all taking great care of your child, um, but I'm going to guess that you are not holding yourself to the same standard. And so I really wanna challenge you to ask yourself, um, what are you doing for your child that you're not doing for yourself and why not? Why aren't you doing it for yourself? Um, and there's a really good reason to model that self-care for oneself, um, because if you don't, you're really sort of modeling a, a lack of, of care for yourself, a worthlessness. I'm uh, devoting extra time and attention to myself isn't important because I'm not worth it. So it really conveys something about your own belief about how valuable and, and worthy you are as a person. And I know that we don't want our kids to either view us in that light or perhaps worse yet, um, come to view themselves in that light later on. And then I also want to urge all of you to give yourself a break. Um, and I, I mean this literally and figuratively. Um, so literally give yourself a non-screen break. If you have young kids, take a physical break, like physically remove yourself from your young children um, to get some much needed rest. There's so much running around um, and activity that goes on with young kids. And then if you have older kids, you probably are in a greater need of an emotional um, break. So again, take some time away, do those things that are really restorative for your mental health and wellness. Um, and then I do mean also take, give yourself the figurative break. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but, um, because we're going to talk about warmth and self-compassion, but I do mean the figurative cut yourself a break and give yourself a little bit of slack. Um, we're all doing our best here. And, and, um, and the truth is every single person is kind of winging it. We're all winging it. Um, so cut yourself a break. Any questions so far? Anything no, in the, in the chat? Nothing in the chat so far. Okay. All right. I also want to talk about something called Nixon, um, which is a Dutch term, which literally means nothing. Um, so I've encouraged you to take a break. Break. This is a particular kind of break that I think is a super healthy one. You know, a meditation is all the rage and I very much believe in meditation. I think this is just if meditation isn't for you or if it wasn't something that sort of caught on or if you want to supplement your meditation with another kind of break, um, Nixon is one that, that can provide that. Um, so anyway, what is it? It is literally doing nothing. Um, making time to do nothing. Now, what happens when you do nothing? You daydream, right? Um, and there is good research that suggests that that daydreaming process um, helps us to be both more creative and better problem solvers. So not only do I encourage you to give, cut yourself some slack, you know, if you ever sat on the couch and really did nothing, I'm not talking about watching Netflix. That's not Nixon. That's not doing nothing. I'm talking about literally TV off on the couch sitting there or, you know, because we so readily, I, I find myself doing it too. You know, I'm going to a doctor's office. I have to wait in the waiting room. And what I used to do is just sort of sit there and think. Um, and now what I do is I dig into my purse and I pull out my phone. Um, and we've lost so much um, in terms of, I think, creativity, our attention span, um, and also our ability to, to creatively solve problems because we don't ever have that time anymore. You know, watch your kids. They don't ever do it. So I encourage you model it um, and encourage your kids to do it too. And don't, don't feel guilty about it um, because it's serving a really important purpose. All right, so let's move on um, to connecting to yourself. So what does that mean? Um, reconnect with yourself. And I added in nature here, um, 
just because I, I've, I've talked in the past about the importance of green space, I'll just say a word or two about it, but we know that there are tremendous physical and emotional benefits of being in green space, which is the woods, um, you know, a, a park, and being in nature of, of any sort. We know that within 15 minutes, your blood pressure um, is significantly reduced. So tons of benefits there. Um, so whatever helps you to re, I mean, for me, sort of being in nature helps me think about, uh, helps me reconnect with myself because let's say I'm either sitting or walking I'm thinking and I'm thinking about my day and I'm thinking about what's coming up and I'm evaluating and assessing and, uh, and problem solving. Um, and that sort of reflective process of thinking about what happened, um, analyzing it, evaluating it, adjusting what you're going to do in the future. I mean, really, that is effectively problem solving. And it's a really, really important coping skill. So if we're not having time to reflect, we're not really taking advantage of the learning that comes from our past experience and we're less able to apply it moving forward. Um, and then as I noted earlier, I really just wanna encourage you, devote some percentage of your current stream screen time to self-care. And I wrote, there's an app for that, but um, you probably all know that your phone tracks it anyway. So you can use an app to track how you're spending your time, or at least on iPhones, I don't know about Android phones, but I'm sure they probably do as well. You can see not only how much time you use, but exactly how you used it. Um, I'm always shocked to see how much I was on my phone. Um, and so if I um, commit only a small percentage of that time to self-care, um, I'm going to be better off even if it's five minutes. And then the last bullet point here is know your values. Um, and the reason that I'm suggesting that you think about and reflect on your values is because it makes um, decision-making and goal-setting um, and just plain behaving much more efficient and easy. So there's a lot of um, values assessments that are available online that will, you know, ask you a lot of questions and then help to do, you know, based on your responses to those questions, it helps you to determine what are those things that you value? Do you value curiosity? Do you value um, being in nature? Do you value um, intelligence? You know, what are, what are the important things to you? Do you value love or happiness? Um, and knowing those values can really help you to be a very effective decision maker um, and goal setter. So I would really encourage you to, to uh, think about that, spend some time thinking about that. And uh, on to our next self-care strategy, connect to others. So um, power comes from people. I, I happen to be a firm believer that the real meaning, or at least my, I'll just speak for myself, my personal meaning in life really comes through my relationships with other people. That is what gives my life significant meaning. Um, and that's true for many people. Um, and we, as you know, we're in a time where those connections are really hampered. Um, and so we have to get super creative um, to find ways to keep up those connections because they are not only sustaining, but um, they help us to grow, they help us to learn, they help us to keep going. Um, and I also want to put in a plug for um, not being afraid to ask for help. Um, it's very typical for a harried parent um, to help their child, expect their child to ask for help. I mean, how many times have you said to your child, you know, if you didn't understand it, why don't you raise your hand and ask for help? Um, but how many parents have a difficult time asking for help? Um, even my, my father um, has a really hard time accepting help. He's in his mid, actually late seventies at this point. Um, and so he's not in a physical position to be able to do some heavy lifting. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, there's offers of help to him to do things and he rejects them each and every time. And I had to say, dad, you know, if you let me help you, it's a gift to me. 
um, as well as being a gift to you. And I think that's a really important message because as parents, we're requiring our kids or asking our kids to seek out help when they need it. Um, but I find that we don't readily do that um, as often. And again, we wanna be great role models. All right, and then we wanna focus on warmth. So what does that mean? Um, I have long said that it is um, really important to treat yourself as you would your best friend. Um, we have standards for ourselves um, that are uh, really high um, most times. Um, you know, we're, we're much kinder to others um, and much less kind to ourselves. And again, there's some, um, you know, why is that? It's the same story as I was saying earlier with your kids. Um, you know, why do we treat them so well and, and care about their health and well-being and we let ours kind of slack? Um, and the same is true with best friends. You know, we would never do to a best friend some of the things that we do to ourselves um, in terms of, you know, critical thinking, um, you know, calling ourselves names in our, in our head, um, we would never do that to a friend, but, you know, when was the last time you, you know, were self-critical about something you meant to do or wanted to do or forgot to do or felt too tired to do, um, we can be really very critical. So I, I just want to encourage everybody to hold, to hold yourself to the same standard that you would hold your friend to. Um, and forgive yourself for being an imperfect human. Um, I happen to think that um, it is really important as a parent to make parenting mistakes um, because it serves as a really important model for kids so kids can learn how to make mistakes and not only learn how to make mistakes, they do that naturally, but to value the mistake, um, to learn from the mistake and maybe even more to appreciate the mistake. Um, so I, I happen to have a, a family philosophy where, um, you know, when my kids have made some kind of mistake or bring home a low grade or, you know, whatever it is, I, um, I, I kind of celebrate it. I talk about why it's, um, why it's important. Not that I'm glad the mistake happened, um, but in a way I am glad the mistake happened because, you know, mistakes have value. They teach us what we don't already know. They tell us what we need to do differently. They keep us humble. They help us to relate to other people who are struggling either with that same mistake or with other mistakes. Um, I'm sure there's other great benefits of, of mistakes. Um, so anyway, yeah, they're not so bad. They're, they're actually um, quite helpful. And practice self-compassion. Boy, is this a skill that's really hard to develop. Um, and I'm not going to do it justice. So I'm going to point you towards Kristen Neff, who is a researcher who has really devoted all of her time and her research and her life to the practice of self-compassion. Um, she's got lots of wonderful materials to consume, um, videos, books, et cetera, um, to really help you to develop um, a practice of self-compassion. We're very good at being focused on other people and compassionate towards other people, but not so great when it comes to ourselves. All right. Any questions on part one before we move on? Or does anybody want to share any um, self-care strategies that they've found helpful? Just give it a second to see if anyone. Sure thing. Pops up in the chat. We don't have any questions at this time. All right. Well, let's move on to enhancing parent-child relationships. All right, so I'm presenting here four keys to a strong parent-child relationship, but I want to say at the get-go that absolutely um, there's more to it than this. Um, we're just scratching the surface. This is four of 4 million different ways to develop a good, healthy relationship with your child. Um, so the first one, be open to listening and learning. We all know the importance of listening to our child. I mean, really listening, um, as in don't talk, um, except maybe to ask questions. Um, there's some research, which I really find fascinating about how to get people to like you 
I'm going to connect this back to your child in a minute, but I want you to think about those times that maybe you went to, a, I don't know, a social event um, and you met someone and you had a conversation with them and you left feeling like that person was just so amazing. You just really, really liked them. Um, and it was quick and kind of instantaneous. And you just had very warm feelings towards that person. Odds are what that person did was ask you a lot of questions about, about yourself, your life. Um, it is a fact we like to talk about our own. We like to talk about ourselves, most people, not all. Um, and so when someone expresses interest in getting to know us by asking a lot of questions, um, we like them better. It, I mean, that's a fact. Um, that's what the research suggests. That's, that's not my sort of theory. And I think that we can use that principle to um, really get our kids talking and really listen to them. So, you know, I want to suggest the following strategy. Ask your kids questions. And it's not, you can't, you know, the research says you can't just bombard a whole bunch of different questions about different topics. It has to be questions that are on a single topic and deepening the your understanding of that particular topic. So you ask follow up questions that are sort of on the same line. Now, because if you just ask questions all over the place, research says they don't like you more. And we're, I mean, not that we're trying to get our kid to like us more, although maybe we are. I mean, isn't, I, I suppose that makes for a strong relationship. Liking one another is an important part of that. Um, so, you know, some of you may be saying, well, I, I, you know, my child doesn't answer any questions. You know, I can't ask them questions. They're annoyed when I ask them questions. Um, and that certainly could be the case. And, and if that is the case, you know, I would say, what are you asking the questions about? So these aren't questions about tell me about your homework or even tell me about what you did today, but rather um, find their passion um, and learn about it. You know, what is it? So maybe you have a child and, you know, a lot of your arguments are about how much time they're spending playing video games. You know, my recommendation to parents is to sit down with that child um, and have them teach you the video game. Learn about it. Ask questions about it. Make sure that you're listening and understanding um, their experience of it, why they enjoy it, how good are they at it, um, and have them teach you something that they're passionate about. And I'm going to guess that's going to sort of open that conversation and lead the way, maybe not immediately, but lead the way for you to be able to have conversations about more, um, more sort of sensitive or more difficult topics. Um, I, my oldest son is, I don't know, 21 or 22. I think he's 22 now. And when he was 14, it was when The Walking Dead came out and uh, he was watching The Walking Dead. And I would occasionally walk by and I would see it on TV. And I was like really repulsed by it. Quite honestly, I could not imagine why anyone would possibly watch that. It was gory and violent and I really didn't like it. Um, and I, I asked my son, like, why are you watching this? What's, what's in it for you? And he said to me, um, I'll watch it with you. I'll go back. Let's go back to the first episode and let's watch it together. And I thought, man, when your 14 year old son is asking you to do anything with him, um, you, you do it. And so I did. So I, I actually became a walking dead fan. Um, but I watched it with him and that, I think, you know, those are the kinds of experiences where we can, um, I mean, I didn't love it at first and I did grow to appreciate it really, but Maybe I wouldn't have, you know, depending on what it was, it doesn't matter. We spent time together. I had I developed a better understanding of him and, and what kind of enjoyment he was getting out of it. And he enjoyed sharing it with me. That's the part really that I want to hit home, that teaching. Get your child to be in a teaching position and have them teach you um, about things. So, you know, the parenting role, I think sometimes we take on the parenting role of like boss and I'm going to say, you know, maybe we ought to shift from boss parent to consultant parent. 
um, or occasionally to learner. I mean, let's not fall into the trap of believing that our kids have nothing to teach us um, because they certainly, certainly do. All right. Um, so that was a long winded um, <laughs> explanation of, of number, the first key. All right, so let's move on to reversing the vicious cycle. Um, and what I mean by that is um, in the parents that, in, in the families that I've worked with, it is very often the case, particularly with um, teenage kids, that often there's kind of this negative cycle that happens where the child's engaging in some kind of misbehavior or some kind of behavior that is um, maladaptive or the parent doesn't like. And then the parent sort of critiques the child and that behavior um, and asks them not to do it, um, maybe shouts or maybe doesn't, but maybe ends up shouting. Usually it doesn't end up being very adaptive, um, which then leads the child to either engage in the behavior more or to become um, annoyed or angry or upset. And, and you just get this sort of vicious cycle of discontent and yelling and more discontent and, and more yelling. And I think that, um, you know, we really need to find ways to break that cycle. And so how do you break the cycle or reverse the cycle? You gotta step outside of it. And odds are the parent's gonna be have, have to be the one to um, take a new action to reverse or break the cycle. And, you know, I would recommend doing it in the following way. And that is um, to find something good um, in your child's behavior to um, compliment them on no matter what it is, search for it all day long. So usually as parents, we're, we're and our brains are, are prepared to do this. We look for the bad um, because we are sort of evolutionarily prepared to look for threats in our environment because it enhances our, our uh, survival. And we do this with our kids. So we're constantly on the lookout for negative things that they're doing because we can't help ourselves because that's how we're programmed. Um, and so I want you to, you know, to, to think about um, being more um, thoughtful or deliberate in not doing that and instead doing the opposite and looking for the positives. Um, my mom sometimes tells the story of my younger sister um, who was at home with her, really giving her a hard time. And my mom was trying this technique, you know, of trying to say something nice. And she would she later told me, you know, I couldn't find anything, Ellen. I could not find anything. The only thing I could find was that she put her seatbelt on in the car. And so my mom said that that was it. That's what I had to go with. That was the best I could do. And so she, you know, said, my sister's name is Kate. And, you know, Kate got in the car, she put her seatbelt on. And my mom said, you know, I really, really appreciate it and, and love that every time you get in the car, you put your seatbelt on. Um, so sometimes you got to dig deep to find it, but it doesn't matter. It's there. Your kids are definitely doing good things. You just got to look and, and find them and remember that our brains are set to do the opposite. So it's really going to take some work um, to do that. I also just want to make a pitch for recognizing that sometimes um, when we're interacting with our kids, we are anticipating how they're feeling based on how we are feeling. Um, so we do this in all kinds of interpersonal relationships and it can get us into trouble. So when we meet people that we don't know versus the people that we do know well, we're at less risk for it. Because if you meet somebody you don't know and you're talking about anything, you don't presume that you know how they feel because you've just met them. But when we're with loved ones and with our kids, we make assumptions about how we think they're feeling and odds are that assumption that you're making about how they're feeling is how you personally are feeling, not necessarily how your loved one is feeling. Um, and so again, just a, just a pitch in your interactions with your kids, make sure you're not falling into that pitfall. And I'll tell a quick story about a time that I fell into it. Um, I had a colleague at work who told me that when her daughter was younger, um, she was often late to pick up her daughter at daycare. And her daughter was really upset by it um, and still talked about it as a you know young woman was still talking about the upsetness. And as a harried um, 
mother myself, I was also often late to, you know, pick up my kids or to meet the school bus. And in fact, had um, more than one time um, not met the school bus because I was too late, you know, got tied up at work or lost track of time and then didn't meet the school bus. And um, so then what happens if you're not there is the school bus goes back to the school and the kids go to the principal's office. Lovely. So um, this happened to my kids and I said to them, I, I'm thinking of my colleague and her upset daughter and I decided I'm going to check in on my kids, you know, emotional well-being. And I said to them, how do you feel? Because I'm thinking, you know, I'm using my own empathy and I'm projecting it kind of onto them. And I'm thinking they must be devastated. You know, I'm embarrassed. I have to do the walk of shame to the principal's office. It's really terrible. And um, so I say to them, how does it make you feel? And I'm, and I'm, fully prepared for them to say how awful it makes them feel. And they said, we love it. And I was like, what? Um, they said, yeah, we love it. We get to go to the principal's office and she gives us popcorn. Um, so don't, don't assume that you know um, your child's emotional experience because sometimes you're wrong um, and you really got to ask. All right, moving on to be a coping model. Now there are two kinds of modeling. You know, as parents, we're modeling our, um, we're modeling behavior for our kids all the time, whether we like it or not, good and bad, and they are learning from us good and bad. So I want to just take a second to talk about two different kinds of coping, two different kinds of modeling, um, because one kind is better than the other. All right, so we have mastery modeling and we have coping modeling. I'm gonna describe them both, and then I want you to um, answer in the chat which one you think is better at teaching a child to learn a new behavior. So there's mastery modeling. So let's say, um, let's pick a behavior. Let's say the behavior is, um, I don't know, uh, well, let's do giving a presentation. That's usually the one. That's what I'm doing now. So um, so let's say you're trying to teach your child how they have to give a presentation in front of the class and you're trying to teach them how to do it and you're modeling for them. So you're saying, look, I want you to watch me. Here's how you do it. And you give this talk and you're funny and you're witty and you never lose your place. And it's very polished and you're eloquent and your audience is wrapped um, and they applaud you. They give you a standing ovation because you did such a fantastic job. That's mastery modeling. Now, contrast that with coping modeling in which you're trying to teach a skill. Let's say again, it's giving a presentation in front of the class and you model an imperfect presentation. So you lose your place, um, you stutter, you forget what you were going to say, you fumble over an answer um, to a question from somebody in the audience. Um, you say, um, and you use that as your model for how to teach, how to give a presentation. So now let's take a moment in the chat. I'm gonna see if I can open the chat and tell me which one is better um, for having your child learn how to do a presentation in front of the class. Mastery modeling better, coping modeling better. I'm going to chime in and think my the answer is coping modeling because presenting is hard enough um, and nerve wracking for kids. And so we don't want them to necessarily think that they have to get a 10 the first round or the first time and that they can learn from every experience. Yes, exactly. I don't know why, but my clicker, oh, there we go. All right, um, yeah, exactly, coping modeling. It gives them a model. They look at they look at mastery modeling and they say, yeah, I never do that. No way, just can't do that. They look at coping modeling and say, all right, well, maybe I could do that. And I already saw how to get over the bumps. So if those bumps you know, or fumbles happen to me, I'll know kind of how to recover from them. Exactly. All right, so moving on, grow your parenting alongside your child. So again, in you know, a lot of my clinical work with families, I often see parents who um, 
you know, kids are growing. Cons, you know, they're, they're developing. They're going from two to four um, to teenagers before you know it. And oftentimes I think parents don't change the way that they're parenting. So, you know, occasionally I'll see some adolescent parent friction. Um, and when I really sort of dive in deep, it becomes kind of apparent that we have a semi-adult um, and a parent who's hasn't, whose parenting hasn't really caught up. Um, so, uh, you know, I also think that as, as parents and maybe psychology really is to blame for this, but we don't we don't talk about how to be a good parent. We don't talk about how to change your parenting or what's appropriate parenting for a two-year-old, what's appropriate parenting for a 17-year-old um, because they're vastly different. So, uh, you know, I don't have all the answers. I can't tell you, oh, given your child's age, this is what your parenting should look like. Um, but I sure can say that as your child ages, you really want to be growing and changing and adapting your parenting as they get older. Because if you don't, you could end up in this situation. These are the terrible 22s. <laughs> it's kind of funny. All right. So that is the end of the presentation, but I do want to ask one thing before I go um, or before I finish up, before I open it up to questions. Um, and that is a colleague and I wrote a book about helping school age children to sleep independently. Um, so there's plenty of parents whose kids are, you know, either the parents are sleeping in the child's bed or the child's sleeping in the parent's bed and the parents don't want it that way. Um, and so what we did was wrote a book, you know, with a six week plan on how to get your child to happily and healthily sleep alone. Um, and we want to run it past some parents. Um, so we're interested in giving out the book free. We're, we're not looking, you know, we're not trying to hook anybody into anything. We just really want some parent feedback on, on the book. So if you happen to be a parent um, who has a child who isn't sleeping independently and you're interested in getting a free book and telling us what you think about it and how this plan worked um, with you, because our plan is to take that parent feedback and edit our book before we submit it for publication. Um, so if you're interested in that, give me an email at ellen at highperformance-parenting.com or um, you can email me here here at my URI address, efschroeder at uri.edu. But I do want to backtrack for one second just to remind you, January 12th, building your child's coping skills. March 2nd, avoiding the trap of overparenting in unprecedented times. I hope to see you there. Um, and I'll stop now and answer any questions, if there are any. How about I've been talking to you this whole time on mute. Um, Amy yeah. did did put in the chat that she would love this help. I'm thinking Amy was referring to the book. So do you think you could just toggle back to that slide? Um, um, sure. Or I mean, Amy could just email me at efschroeder at uri.edu either way. I'm trying okay. to toggle back. I'm just... There we go. Yeah. E either way, you, you can reach me any anywhere anyhow it's fine do we have any other questions or comments tonight oh amy says yes please my six and three year old are so dependent on me for sleep thank you awesome thank you amy it's just parents like you we're looking to to help and we're you know hopefully it'll be a mutually beneficial um association where you know you can get your kids in their own beds um sleeping on their own and help us out by letting you know what you think about our plan. Any other questions or comments for um, for mm -hmm. Dr. Ellen Flannery Schroeder tonight? Mary says, thank you. Amy says, thank you for the info. You're welcome. Thank you for joining. Um, Ellen, could you also go back to the slide with the um, 
the uh, additional sessions that we're offering. Thank you. Thanks for reading my mind. Um, yeah, so please consider joining us for January 12th, Building Your Child's, Child's Coping Skills. It'll be another virtual workshop just like tonight's. Um, and hope, hopefully that's a session that you'll find interesting and will consider joining and also bring a friend. We would love um, for you to spread the word and um, have some more participants joining us. Leslie says, terrific presentation. Linda says, thank you so much. Um, where can I get this recorded workshop? Mary, we will share that with you um, and put it on our website as soon as it is ready. The, the workshop is being recorded tonight. Um, and like I said, it'll be posted to the East Providence School Department website um, as soon as it's ready. Yeah, I really want to put in a plug for January 12th because that's super, so, important. so important. I mean, life changing, really. And not only not only for your child, but I think for adults as well, because where I mean, you know, you can go to a cognitive behavioral therapy, you can learn these coping skills. Some schools maybe are doing some coping skills in schools. Um, but it's really unfortunate that we don't have easier access um, to learn this stuff. You know, we, we don't, I don't know, we're just, I don't feel like we're doing a very good job of getting the word out. You know, here are the skills your child needs to be happy and healthy and ward off mental health difficulties. Um, but there's, you know, pretty easy to understand um, and relatively easy to implement um, skills that will make a very big difference in, in your life and your child's. And I think we're, we're seeing a particular need for this right now as well. Like um, more so probably, I mean, it's always been a great need, but I think even more so than it, ha than it has been in recent years. So I think this is definitely um, going to be a really important workshop for um, parents and educators and, you know, the community as well. So totally agree. We're on the same page. Nancy says, thank you for another great workshop. Well, thank you again for coming. I hope it was helpful. I always strive to, you know, make it practical. I, I hope it was practical and able to be implemented. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Like I said, please um, put January 12th on your calendar. I will also, um, it will also be shared on social media and it will, um, I'll create another event like I did tonight so that it will help to remind you of when the event is coming up. So thank you for joining us and thank you, um, Dr. Flannery Schroeder for joining us this evening and for another fantastic presentation. Thank you. All right. Have a good night, everyone.